FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's 9 20 18. Well, have you ever wanted to travel the world, make money along the way, and basically just go wherever your little heart desires to take you? Well, people out there are doing it, and you're going to learn how to do it. But first, as always, be a part of the show. Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Dot com. So with us now is Andrew Henderson. Andrew, your site, nomadcapitalist.com. And you deal with a lot of uh, issues of how to become an expat, a U.S. expat, how to get a second passport, global citizenship. Well, thanks for coming on and we welcome you to the show. My pleasure, Kerry. So uh, when did you kind of hit the road and become a global citizen, Andrew? Well, it's been a lifelong process. I like to say I've been I've been working up to this my entire life. Um, what I talk about in my book, Nomad Capitalist, is is the story of how my father introduced "Go where you're treated best" to me at a very young age, and I ruminated over that as a kid, and I wanted to live overseas. Uh, but what I did uh, when I first uh, became an adult was I just decided to stay in the U.S. and build a business. And I kept doing that for a while. But eventually, uh, it's been about 11 years now that I'm slowly and steadily traveling more before finally uh, leaving uh, about a half a dozen years ago, uh, seven years ago, perhaps now, to say for most, if not all the time, I'm out of the United States. I'm living in other countries. I'm enjoying the benefits of that. And uh, it's been more and more ever since then, I mean, 25 to 30 countries a year, although trying to scale back. And um, it's been a long process of finding out, you know, where is your home in the world? Because there are other homes. And so where is your home? Well, it's a constantly evolving process for me. I think that what I like is I like places that are open. So I like Malaysia. I have a home in Malaysia. I like the Republic of Georgia. It's a very open society. I'm, I'm there now and I'm there part of the time. I like Montenegro as a summer place, very open place. And I'm looking for other places. I'm looking for perhaps that more developed base, a place like London uh, comes to mind. But those are the big three. And I spend a lot of time regionally. I spend a lot of time in Cambodia. Um, I'm spending more and more time in Armenia right now. I like to go to places that are, are off the radar, both so that I can live without having to be one of a million expats and be part of that circle. But also I want to see how things are emerging and how the world is emerging. And I think those are good places for that. And when you say you want to go where you're treated the best, how do you define being treated the best? There's a lot of ways that you can define being treated best. I mean, when I bank, I want to bank with the best banks. So you know, I'll go to Singapore and I'll get an account at one of the 10 strongest banks in the world. As you know, in the U.S., many of the banks are weak banks. These are not strong banks. People look at what's happening in the United States, the U.K., many of these countries, the banks are not so strong. I want the best banks uh, when I have a company. You know, I set up a company in the place where I can pay very little in tax and where they don't hassle me and they don't make me, you know, send in 3,000 pounds of paperwork every year to, you know, tell everything I'm doing. Um, you know, when I live someplace, I like open cultures where it's not hyper nationalistic, where people are friendly, where you can get around. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that I think differ from person to person, but from a financial concept. We're talking about finances on your show. Um, you know, I think it's a matter of where are institutions the strongest, where are taxes the lowest, where are governments the easiest to get along with, where are returns the highest, where is risk the lowest. So, so different places fall into those categories then, don't they? Right. So, you know, would I go and live in Singapore? Um, perhaps. I mean, I think that my opinion and, and many people's opinions change. I mean, someone, I'm someone now who you know, we'll be married, we'll potentially have a family in the next couple of years. And so Singapore looks better in that perspective than it did, you know, five years ago. But I'm probably not going to live in Singapore. I'd rather treat that as a wealth hub. Um, and that's what they're best at. 
Um, you know, I would like to go and live somewhere else where costs are lower, um, where I can, I guess, have a protest if I want to, or, or, you know, I can drink a bottle of water on the subway. Um, so I think that different things fit into different categories and it's all about diversifying yourself and, and having passport bucket having the residence bucket, having the travel bucket. Yeah. So Ben, how many countries have you been to Andrew? It's about a hundred now. A hundred. And so as far as ones to live in, uh, and you said you're going to have a family and obviously you want them to have a good education. Uh, what are you looking at right now? Um, I think you mentioned it, but just tell us where your preferential, where your place of preference is now. Well, I think that the places where I'm at now are good. I think, you know, like I said, Montenegro is a very open, great place for the summer. I'm kind of becoming a guy who's trying to work a little bit less after you know, 14, 15 years of being 24 seven, I'd, I'd like mm -hmm. to do the summer lifestyle. I think it's a great place. Um, I think Malaysia could still be a good place. Um, you know, I think there are other good places. I think actually contrary to what many people believe Mexico is a good place. Uh, I'm not sure if Colombia is maybe the best place for a family, but I think it's a good place to live. Um, but you know, to answer your question about education, I think that my perspective is bring in the best tutors, bring in the best teachers privately. I think what you're probably going to see uh, in the next five to 10 years is a proliferation of educational opportunities for people who live the way I do as more and more people want to live this way and having some kind of shared tutors or having people basically create their own schools. Um, this is a conversation I've had in my relationship where uh, I don't know that I want to be locked down to one place all the year and whatever that place may be. I don't really know that I want my kids going to the Malaysian school system and and, uh, you know, it'd be nice for them to learn Chinese at a Chinese school. But but then the Chinese school system is a bit more, um, you know, dated in how they teach. And so I think that, you know, I'd say, all right, great, let's hire a tutor and let's have that person travel with us. And if other people want to come along for that ride and share our location preferences, then then let's do that together. So, all right. So you're going overseas and obviously there's language issues, there's cultural issues. How do you open a business in a foreign country and, and thrive? Well, there's a cultural issue. I think that culture is a big issue. I mean, you look at where I'm at in Georgia, compare that to Armenia. I mean, Georgia has always been kind of the regional hub. So number one is I look for a place that has a diverse culture. Malaysia, again, I mean, I'm, I'm broken record in these places, but these are places with diverse populations of different ethnicities, um, you know, versus a place like a Turkey, for example, where they don't even have Italian food um, that I think is probably more difficult to get your, your foot in the door. So if you're going to start a business. I want a place that's an open culture and I want an open government. But I think that the bigger thing uh, that's important is you don't have to come to Georgia or Malaysia or wherever and start your business here. Uh, I think what a lot of people that I work with are doing is they have a business that's in the U.S., for example. They're selling stuff on Amazon. They're doing consulting. They're doing affiliate marketing. They're doing whatever. The business sits in this global sphere they incorporate the business somewhere friendly and then they run that from wherever they live. And if we do it properly, they can live in a very tax friendly way, in a very efficient way. Um, and they don't have to deal with, you know, how do I set up a business, uh, you know, in, in Serbia. And I think that's probably the easier way for most people to go about doing it. Um, although, you know, for the real adventure, I suppose there's a way to, you know, go to, you know, Cambodia, I have a friend who's doing a business in Cambodia. Um, and, and he does properties and they're doing a phenomenal job. And I think it's just a matter of telling yourself you're going to do it and, and making it happen and learning how things work and pushing your way through. And I think that's the same you do with any other business, except the opportunities are much higher. But for most people, I think it's better to have something that sits on the global level. Right. So, you know, without uh, not having a family, uh, it was easier to do it. What if you have a family? And to just pick up and leave is a difficult, uh, difficult task, isn't it? Well, I have a friend and a mentor who is a great quote. You know, he says, everything's easy and nothing's easy. I mean, it's, it's easy if you decide you want to do it. And I think that I know a lot of families. I also know a lot of couples. In fact, that's been kind of the biggest growth in our business is people who are married couples who do this. And some of them want to have kids. Uh, and I don't know that it's so difficult. I, I think that there's different ways to live this lifestyle. I've, I've moved around a lot. Um, well, what I see a lot of people wanting to do, 
you know, when I talk to people who make half a million, a million, $2 million a year is they want that one or two places. And so I don't think that, you know, having one or two places that you live is any different than I live in Boston and I summer on Martha's Vineyard and, and maybe in the winter I spend a couple months down in Florida. Um, I don't see the big difference. And I think that what people get caught up on is uh, these kind of these fictional lines, these borders where somehow, you know, moving from California to Florida to save on taxes is a smart thing. But what's really different from moving to California to Mexico or to Panama or to while you're doing it, you know, Malta or Malaysia. I mean, what's the real difference? I mean, more people speak English in the city center of Kuala Lumpur than in many parts of Miami. So I think that when you really break it down, you can create a way of living like this that works for you, whether you have a wife or husband or or even kids. Mm -hmm. So what obviously you help people do this. Uh, what do you help people do? What do you do exactly? Well, there's a couple areas that I think people, when they want to go all in, look at. There's the financial area. How do I reduce my tax? Where do I put my company? Where do I put my investments? Where do I put everything I'm making money from? How do I get that to be tax friendly? Where am I putting my assets so I'm diverse? Mm-hmm. I, you know, protecting my assets. That's the financial part. Then there's the residence and citizenship part. You know, where do I want to live? Where do I want to live in paper? Where do I want to have my tax residence? Where do I want to be a citizen? Having a couple citizenships. If I'm a U.S. citizen, do I want to stay a U.S. citizen? I ultimately chose no. And then there's the investments. You know, where do I want to put my money? Am I putting money in banks, earning 10% interest? Am I going to put my money in the Cambodia property? Am I going to go somewhere else? You know, what am I going to do? And those things all can work together. Mm-hmm. You know, there are places where you can go and buy high yielding property that if you're an American, you can get a passport by doing so. And so you can do those two things together and they work well. Right. The, mm-hmm. They're Amazon. and they're sitting in, you know, Florida and instead of a, you know, a Bahamas company, BVI company, and they just put the assets in that company and then they stay in the United States and they have get in big trouble. Right. Is put the, together the holistic and it says, can go to the lawyer and, you know, Nevis, and he's going to sell you on Nevis. And then he's not going to know how to tell you what to do on the U.S. tax side or where to live or how to avoid tax over there or what to do or how the passport works. There's a holistic picture that I think has to be considered if you have a specific goal in mind, i.e., I want to pay a lot less tax. I want to be free. I want to travel. And that's what we manage to to strategize and then to execute. Gotcha. So so there's a lot of thought that goes into this. You can't just say, I'm going and then just go. You gotta plan your taxes, your citizenship, all of these things. So is there a plan that you can follow for doing this the right way? Andrew? Well, everyone's plan is going to be different. I mean, so I do think that just picking up and going is a good idea. And and to a certain extent, figuring things out as you go along. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, let me go to Mexico. Let me go to some of these countries and check it out for a while. And maybe you're not fully tax optimized right away, but you need to get a comfort with the fact that other countries essentially operate the same way. I understand that, yes, the U.S. and Mexico and Singapore and all these places are somewhat different, but they also have a lot of similarities. And, you know, nobody is sitting around in Singapore saying, gee, all of our banks have just failed. You know, I mean, you put your money in the bank, it's basically the same thing at the end of the day. So I think having a plan is important, but everyone's plan is going to be different. Um, and, And I just spoke with someone who is in the the real estate investing business. He makes a lot of money investing in U.S. real estate. Well, that's not traditionally someone that I would talk to, um, but he can use that U.S. real estate income to propel him to start his, his online business and then move that into an offshore company and then you know figure out where he wants to live. So everyone's got a different approach based on how they want to live, what their situation is, what their business is, whatever. Um, so it really differs from person to person. Yeah. So uh, how many people you talk to in a month who are looking to pull up their roots and move? I think the business is becoming a lot bigger because you have so many of these, as I think we, we talked about millennials who are starting online businesses. So I think that the field for this, people are realizing that you can go across borders and, and reduce your risk, increase your money. You know, I talk to a pretty limited number of people. I, obviously, I'm out and about in the world meeting people um, through my network. But, um, you know, we have, uh, in the last, um, two and a half years, about 80,000 people have, have gone through our application process to get some help with this. And it's basically growing uh, on a monthly basis. 
of people who want help. Now, obviously, most of those people, you know, they're not making that much money or, you know, they're not quite ready or a couple of them are just jerks and we don't want to talk to them. Sure. But, you know, I talk to, you know, four or five people a month. We generally work with about four people a month. Um, and, you know, we put together a plan and we, and we go from there. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, my big thing is having 1,300 blog posts, 300 videos, podcasts, et cetera, for everyone else, people to consume and at least get some ideas of how they can put it together. Because I do think that you're going to see an explosion of people who want to do this in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Definitely sounds like you're onto a trend here and it's definitely worth uh, taking a look at. You know, the world's a lot smaller than it used to be. The thought of living overseas was only a dream that could be realized by a relatively small percentage of people, like well under 1%. Now, with uh, internet rapid communication and, of course, universal air travel, uh, a, lot of, a lot more people can, can do this, can realize the dream. And is it the kind of thing, Andrew, that you have to like commit to and that's it? Or can you come back again? Well, I think that flexibility is a very important thing to have. I mean, when I'm working with somebody, you know, I had a guy the other day in Australia. And I said, listen, you know, if you want this to work from a financial standpoint, I mean, you've got to commit to being out for a while. So I look at this, like, if you come back six months from when you left, it may be like taking an early withdrawal on a CD at the bank where they say, okay, fine, you don't, here's your money back. You don't get any interest. I mean, if you leave the country for six months, you're probably not getting any tax benefits. Um, but what I did is I, I said, you know what, I'm going to commit to a year. I'm going to go to these different countries. I'm going to see what I'm comfortable with. And I'm going to figure out what my plan is going to be from there. I'm going to do some exploring. And to me, that was kind of, that gave me the ability to say, okay, fine. If I fail in one year, if I hate it, I'll come back. Um, but what happened in reality was I basically knew it was going to be a go and I would just keep doing it. And I think that, you know, if you allow yourself that opportunity to come back without making it look like you failed, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. I also think that there are plenty of people, Carrie, who just say, you know what, let me get comfortable on the financial side first. Let me go to Singapore or Georgia and open a bank account and move 10 grand into that account and see how I feel about it. And, you know, if three months later your money's still there and you feel okay about it, maybe you do the next step. Maybe you go and buy a house somewhere. Maybe you go and do a property. Maybe for you, leaving physically is the last step. So again, everyone has their own objectives. I think whatever it takes for you to get comfortable is important so that hopefully you can give yourself that early exit possibility. But I think most people I know end up finding it's much more comfortable than they imagined. Yeah, very interesting. And I like the concept. And you always need to be flexible, ready to try new things, do new ways you know, have new ways of doing business and of living. Hey, people want to find out more about you, what you're doing, Andrew. Where's the best place to find you? Nomadcapitalist.com is the website. We've got all the resources there. Uh, we're also on YouTube. We also have the book called Nomad Capitalist on Amazon. That's a good 270-page kind of intro guide. I think what's important, Carrie, is, I mean, nobody can just give you a plan on the radio. Nobody can give you a plan in a book. I mean, it has to be, what are you looking to accomplish? And there's some hard questions that you're going to have to answer and be really honest with yourself. But these are the resources that can help you at least know what's involved. And for, for people who are saying, hey, I already have that business. I'm already making a million bucks a year. What do I do? If you go to nomadcapitalist.com, you can click the, the button and, and get some help too. Very interesting. Well, as always, uh, the link to Andrew's site is in the show notes to this interview on financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Hey, the, again, we ask you to email us with any questions or comments and be a part of the show. And the Twitter feed is at Carrie Lutz, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Andrew, thanks so much for coming on and uh, good luck on your continued journey. My pleasure to be with you, sir. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.